this is the only problem we have today. It's not that. Yeah. You went decades without recording. So. I mean, if it, if it really is the internet, then there's not much we can do about that. Like no. back on on this I've got internet. We've got, I've got back on. Uh, it was going in and off for once. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, it's on now. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for your patience while we got that worked out. We'll start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll start with the approval of the agenda. I've got two changes. Uh, we're going to remove on the consent agenda, um, 2H, so letter H on the consent agenda, the misplaced magnolia that picture did not get here, and then we're going to move J3 of the engineer's report, the INI reduction plan, um, and information to up with the public hearing under E1, that kind of goes together, that way Brandon can do an overview. Let's merge them together. Yep. Okay. So that. Anything else, Tim, to add? Change notes, Jim? No, no. No. Nope. Uh, no. Hearing none, entertain a motion to approve. We'll make that motion. Thanks, Dan. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Dwayne. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, consent agenda. Any questions on the consent agenda? Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thanks, Dwayne. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Bonnie. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Visitors to the Council, Tim Tucker with North Risk Partners Insurance Review. You are up, sir. I get the check. Well, I'm going to Well, good evening. Packets for everybody. I think there's maybe one extra. I am Tim Tucker. I am with North Risk Partners. And I am your insurance rep, your local insurance rep, um, representing the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust. That's your insurance carrier, your insurance company. So I, um, but before I start, I just wanted to applaud the city fathers and mothers. Um, you know, when you drive into Casa, I'm from this area, grew up in Elgin Plainview. Uh, Casson is still a real vibrant town. You can see that right when you drive in. And, um, you know, everybody here deserves credit for that. Um, small town America still lives on. Okay, that said, um, let's start with the, um, with the dividend picture. Um, and we refer to the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust as the League. Anyway. League was formed in 1980, and it was formed um, really on your behalf, municipalities and special districts. And since 1987, they've returned a dividend. And you can see it's had its peaks and valleys. The last two or three years um, have been more valleys than peaks, but they continue to return a dividend. And in year 2019, that dividend was um, was uh, two and a half million dollars and the city of Casson's share of that was 4,880. Now they wouldn't have normally um, uh, provided a dividend this last year but they've kind of had a um, historical basis and trend of it and but with claims trending up um, despite that they've still said hey at the end of the day we're going to return you know, to all of our members a dividend, and if we have to, we will increase rates. And they've done that. This year we've got a, uh, a single digit rate increase from the league, and um, we'll get into that in a second. As you see, page two, 
we covered that. Um, your premium versus your dividend exposure. And then page three, just look at that little graph. I pulled that off the website. That is your, that front little um, graph is your um, five-year claims history. So in all of those areas, so in property, there were 11 claims over the last five years. And um, whether they were all paid out or not, um, that uh, is gonna just show in the itemization. But um, there were, um, and there were several claims, you see in that purple area, in liability. But um, that's where graphs and statistics get a little skewed because um, 10 of those were just in this last spring and you had 10 sewer backup um, water claims. And as I checked the file, um, none of them have, have had payout. Now maybe that's been updated, but um, in looking at it this week, um, there's been no payouts on that. So that's good news. The little graph in the back is your open claims from this year. And there is um, nothing earth shattering in there. You do have one general liability claim. I'm not gonna go into it, um, but uh, uh, that is still open and still has a reserve on it. Okay, renewal pricing is on the next page. And your overall pricing from 2019 to 2020 is a 9% increase. And um, the biggest telltales are in um, general liability and workers' compensation. Um, you paid 40,000 last year in your general liability premium and you are paying 50,000 this year. And the same thing with work comp, 131,000 last year and 148 this year. Um, let me tell you the factors that go into that. There's really only three. The first one is um, exposures. Um, and what we mean by that is if your payrolls go up or you have more vehicles or, you, uh, or your building limits go up or the number of folks in town, uh, your basis goes up. And that did happen. Um, and it happens, of course, annually, incrementally. Um, number two is the carrier, the league itself, taking a rate increase, which they did from last year to this year. It was like 4.4% um, overall from property to, to work comp. And then the city of Cassin's experience in relation to everybody else within the trust. And um, your experience is just ratcheted up a bit. And I'm not gonna go into it a lot. I wanna point out one thing. Your work comp, uh, experience rating is 9% higher than the norm. The norm is 1.0. Yours is 1.09. So you're having 9% more claim than the average. Now that translates, that 9% translates to $13,904. You don't see that in those documents, but it is there and um, it's real, and you can, um, you can work with that. And the biggest thing to work with it is to look at your, your um, claims over the last five years and how you can mitigate those and implement loss control items. And it's something that Nancy and I and, and her troops will talk about this spring because you can't deal with them unless you know what they are, you identify them, and then put loss control measures in place. And the league is very good about wanting to offer you services to keep claims under control. Okay, um, any other questions on the insurance summary? You can kind of walk through that yourself and, and see where we've gone, even on the page two. Your work comp payroll, as I said, is up a little bit. Um, okay, I just want to jump to um, liability for a second. You are under um, statutory limits set up by the state of Minnesota. 
an individual liability claim affecting the city of Casson, whether it be auto or just somebody getting hurt on the street, your the limit is five hundred thousand per claimant. One point five million um, aggregate total. Now the league has stepped that up and actually provides for you limits of two million per claim, three million total in the aggregate. There aren't many claims that escape the statutory guidelines. Only a few. And um, civil right, federal civil rights is one, tort, contract. So any agreements that you have with vendors, contractors, that can esta escape those caps, as well as um, legal action with other states, liquor claims, and um, land use disputes. Um, so that's the reason your limits are higher and you get protection for that outside of the statutory cap. Okay, that said, um, I've given you some pages on what your property schedule looks like and we're not going to go through that because it's too lengthy, but Nancy keeps me up to date on that and we stay up to date on the values um, of that as well, So, which is... Um, of course, important to do, you get replacement cost at time of loss. So we want to make sure the values are uh, replacement cost according to. Um, last thing I, th I think I put in your packet is the safety and loss control uh, workshops. And for Rochester, or for this local region, April 21st is the, um, is the loss control workshop put on by the league. And I would suggest Anybody that's interested, from um, police officers to board members to um, you know to work folks that work for the city, um, look at it. It provides a there's a day long program, provides lunch, and they will give you le the latest regulations, municipal news, police um, wellness. There's going to be a class on that and loss control tip. So, um, you know, it, would, it will be a value, and it's a value if you go once every uh, few years. Um, and then out of your program, the last thing I just wanted to mention is um, the land use credit. You have been able to take advantage of a small land use credit um, by sending one or more people to a little training um, in the past. That's going away after this year. I don't know what the credit was, $500, $1,000, something like that, but they're getting rid of it. They're, they found that the people that were involved in it were, um, uh, well, there weren't enough um, municipalities that were involved in it, and those that were, there was no difference in the claim experience from them to folks that hadn't taken it. So that's the world of insurance. I know it's exciting. I yes. Have, I have one question or comment. Back to the no fault uh, sewer backup yes. limit that we have there, and then you made the comment that it was a good thing that we didn't have any payouts. Yes. I would disagree with that because we have insurance for no fault, but there's a clause in there that excludes it if we get so much rain in a short period of time that it doesn't pay out. And yeah. I would hope that our insurance agency is lobbying the league to change that because we pay for no fault insurance no fault of ours, and rain comes in big bunches now, that needs to be updated. Yeah. So is there is that all we can purchase for that? For $4,500, we get no fault, but really gets no insurance. Good point. And I'll check that out. Because there would have been a lot more claims if they would have actually paid something out. So okay. I think that should be feedback from a lot of people that mm -hmm. it's not a good thing that that wasn't paid. All right. It should have been paid. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that, and I will bring that up. Because the whole reason is if you get rain and something bad happens, that's why you have insurance. That's why. So why have it in the first place? Yes. It's not going to cover it. Right, and, okay. and you're paying for it. Exactly. And then second, does our leasing program for our vehicles affect our rates in any way, positively or negatively? No. Okay. No positive, no negative. It's uh, same thing as um, buying it outright, financing it at the bank, or leasing it. Um, no difference. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions for Tim? Thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. The public forum, I don't have any cards. 
Uh, out of the public. Mr. Mayor. Oh. Mr. Uh, Mayor's report, uh, number one on there was appoint Lori Schultz and John Wright to the library board, our current members being reappointed for another term. So I'll make that motion to appoint those two. Thanks, Mel. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thanks to Lori and John and Smith next meeting for volunteering again um, for that. And we'll have the EDA one at the next meeting. I think EDA is going to talk about that at the next meeting. That's so. a good one. And then just a general update, thanks everybody for coming to the planning session um, on February 15th, I think. Maybe we got a lot of stuff talked about and some information, so thanks. I've for got a whole sheet written up for the next planning session, so if you want to go over it, we'll have okay. more. Okay, I think there'll be more It was good, though. I really time. appreciate that because it was good feedback for me. Yeah. So thank you, and thanks, Charlie, for sitting through that whole day. Appreciate that, too. <laughs> Out of the public hearing. Uh, this is uh, regarding ordinance changes for Chapter 53, which is our sump pump and lateral. So um, we moved the engineer's report, so we're going to open up the public hearing. If there's anybody that has any comments, they're welcome to make those now. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Did you want to give an update, just 30,000 foot for sure. uh, what we're doing? Um, yes, to, to maybe blend into the I-9 reduction plan in your council packet is our draft presentation. Um, and Brian Kamek from our office and Tyler Baumbach are here. Um, they were not allowed to give any comments. That was a uh, pre-qualification of Tony and I. But um, <laughs> Brian, Brian is running the program for us, so you're going to see his face. Um, and just quickly here, um, we'll take any comments you have on the plan. Um, if you do have them, um, we've incorporated the direction you gave us. Um, that is informing the public, having a public engagement, public involvement. We have a website uh, that we reference in here. Um, that's what we're going to roll out to the public. Uh, we currently have scheduled Mar March 18th at 6 p.m. at the Cash Niagara High School in the forum room. Um, we are going to invite the entire city to that meeting. Um, and you as council members are obviously welcome to attend. And I assume if the council is gonna, going to attend, we'll post it. Um, and then Brian and myself will give um, the presentation that's in your council packet uh, to the citizens to educate them, to um, get them up to speed on how we're going to schedule the schedule the inspections and let them know that we are ultimately going to inspect every town or every um, business and in, in home in the city. Um, so with that said, I'd take any comments that you have on that or I don't know if we want to get into it, but I think we have kind of all the meats and the potatoes uh, in there again about the program, what we're going to do it, why we're going to do it, um, really get into the get into the, some of the details there to, to really inform the citizens so we, we can have them understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and that leads into the ordinance that we have proposed for some re res uh, revisions. Uh, that's to, again, your ordinance 53. Uh, we don't have a resolution the council packs, and we're going to bring that back at the next meeting. Uh, Melanie here has a couple comments that we're going to work through, um, bring that to the next meeting um, if we don't have any comments in the public hearing. So we'll have that in resolution format at the next meeting. Perfect. So thank you. And any questions on the presentation, I'll take them now or later if you want a chance to review. I think there's 35 slides in there, so we're going to. We're going to offer them as much information as they need. Um, and then once we get finalized our website, we'll probably send it off to the council too. And that way, give you guys some time to look through it, give us any comments, and get it back to Brian and myself. And we'll add some information if needed in there. So. The, the website is live, right? Okay. So I'll send it out to the council if you guys like to take a look at the website. It has a lot of the public information meeting, the, not only the information meeting itself, but the, the information that we're going to present to the citizens is going to be on that website in addition to them scheduling through that website. So we're going to handle all that um, and then city staff is going to be involved. So um, that's it. Let's Thanks, Brandon. And that PowerPoint is available for the public. If you look at both the city website and the council back up tonight, it is online. So yep. and it'll be on our website and it'll be in the social media um, okay. at the meeting on the 18th. So perfect. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Committee reports. Dan, I'm going to report on Park Ford. Just a uh, couple, three things. Uh, first one is the Boulevard Tree Program. The order deadline is March 27th. Contact uh, the city if you're interested in that. They've budgeted for 75 trees again this year. Um, the other one is the wall at the Burns Park. The park board is met by the council's recommendation. And we've contacted a couple of contractors. They won't be able to come until April they want to make sure all the snow is melted. And, and they just, so they're going to try to come up in April and get two, three more quotes. Okay. So that. Um, 
so that's where that's at. We're just on the hold. Um, the pool this year, they're updating all everybody that has seasonal passes, pitchers, so that make sure that when they're logging in, they're matching up the number to the pitcher. So there will be a night. They don't know when yet, but there will be a pitcher night. They're going to try to get updated software so they can have it on a laptop to take people's pictures, make sure. It might slow people down a little going in, but they want to have a better tally who's there and who's using the passes. Okay. And the city was looking at, the park board was looking at parkland fees. The, port, the board has approved uh, of raising the fee to $300 a lot for any for any subdivision that's going in. So there'll be the current pricing if you figure out right now at four lots per acre, we're getting $200 right now. So the board was just looking at up in it to make sure we could be able to put in parks, maintain parks, trails, etc. And then there was, if I remember, there was a size limit too, right? Yeah, I think uh, what I'll just say is that on that, you know, the uh, the park board took a look at it and they did feel that in their own mind, um, a per lot fee was simpler because it's just um, talking with our city engineer, he's recommending maybe looking at a per residential unit fee because that would take into account the um, higher density development <coughs> as opposed to, you know, just a lot basis, which I think makes some sense. Okay. And then um, we're going to be getting some feedback too in terms of what we want as requirements there. So I don't think any decisions needed tonight, but just I think Dan wanted to let you know and, uh, that we are pursuing some changes there. Um, so I think that's kind of where that is. Okay. Thank you. And then as um, far as the uh, getting more bids and that, are they, is there somebody raising, still doing a fundraiser for that? There, there's a still GoFundMe. Okay. Um, still going. I don't know where it's at, but. So we had, we had originally said, you know, come back by April, let us know what's going on. So I don't know if we can officially extend that. Basically, let's wait to see what bids we get and make yeah. decisions after we get that. But after April, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, number two, Bigelow, Voigt, Glenmary, Platt, Commission to Commit, and Plan Unit Development. We've got two resolutions. Um, let's go with letter A first. So approving the conditional use permit, so we have a presentation, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. My name is Laura Chamberlain. I am a planner with Hoysen and Kochler Group, uh, HKGI, and uh, I've been assisting uh, City of Captain with some planning services during transition. Um, sorry, just making sure that this is all working. Um, and uh -oh. just a moment, sorry. Did Brandon do something with it? <laughs> yeah, but I think that it's definitely that. <laughs> Before you this evening is a uh, subdivision of Bigelow Voigt 8th edition. Uh, the request is the applicant is, is proposing a subdivision of an 11.8 acre parcel um, into three single family detached lots and 20, excuse me, that should read 30 single family attached lots as well as three out lots. Um, this application, in addition to a uh, standard preliminary plat, is also requested for a PUD, which requires a conditional use permit. Um, and that's all explained here. 
the conditional use permit um, also will cover uh, allowing for single family attached lots within the R1 district. Um, typically that would require its own CUP or conditional use permit, but it is combined under the umbrella of the uh, PUD. Uh, this parcel is located in Northwest Cassin, uh, surrounded by other stages of the Bigelow Voight um, to the south and west. There are agricultural uses outside of the city boundaries to the north, and then a landscaping nursery to the east. Uh, the site is currently vacant and has a drainage way um, and some ponding. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, ha held a public hearing and uh, took the following actions. They recommended approval for the conditional use permit for PUD with the suggested conditions and findings of fact as presented by staff. Uh, they did amend uh, those conditions to not include a 12th Street uh, Northwest extension across the site. Similarly, uh, recommended approval for preliminary plat with the same condition, excuse me, amended condition. Um, since the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, the uh, applicant has updated their submittal and worked with city staff um, to accommodate the, the uh, recommended conditions um, by or put forward by uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission. This was their original submittal, and here is the updated submittal. Um, and I'll hi go through. Um, very quickly some of the major things that have changed since the Planning and Zoning Commission saw this proposal. Um, as a site review, uh, within a PUD, uh, this proposal um, meets all of the underlying R1 requirements, except for in one area of requesting of um, exceeding hardcover for the single family attached units. Uh, max percentage. Um, the R1 district has a max percentage of 40%. Um, they are requesting a 55 max for this. Uh, PUDs are allowed to vary from the um, underlying zoning, and so this is the requested um, varying within the PUD. The new elements within the updated site plan, they have added the future city trail location. Uh, there are a few minor adjustments to that that uh, staff have suggested um, to be included within uh, the PUD. Um, they have reconfigured the private roads. There are now two private roads that um, are ending in a cul-de-sac. Previously, uh, 12th Street excuse me, 12th Street Northwest had stubbed at the edge of the eastern edge of the property um, and now instead uh, the private streets start at 11th Avenue and um, have a full cul-de-sac that would accommodate <coughs> um, circulating fire and um, safety vehicles. With the reconfiguration of um, the uh, of the private roads, it has allowed for two more lot or single family attached lots to fit within that area. So there are two more than what the Planning and Zoning Commission saw. Um, there also has been a reconfiguration of uh, single family detached lots. There is now one less lot within this area. Similarly, the um, street connection between 12th Avenue Northwest and 12th Street Northwest has more of a general curve now. It used to be more um, of a 90 degree angle. And finally, um, because 12th Street Northwest is not um, coming, is no longer coming through, uh, the existing stub of in within Bigelow I believe um, <coughs> they are proposing a uh, turnaround or a hammerhead turnaround for that. 
Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission provided a list of recommended conditions for each approval. Um, however, since that time, many of those elements have been addressed with the new submittal. So within your packet, um, we do have a redlined copy or kind of response of all of those elements. Um, in addition to that, there are still elements within those conditions that remain um, unaddressed with the new submittal. <coughs> Additionally, with the new layout, there are a few uh, suggestions that staff have um, to address things that hadn't previously existed. Um, so a combination of those still relevant planning and zoning recommendations as well as staff suggestions are within the draft, excuse me, the draft resolutions for your consideration. Um, I do have a list of them here and could go through which ones are new and which ones are not um, if you have questions. <coughs> and so before you are two resolutions for your consideration to act on. What's the reason for changing the hardcover? Um, the hardcover, uh, previously they had not provided what the hardcover amount was, mm -hmm. um, and so I believe it was always the intention for them to ask for a higher hardcover for the single family lot. Um, they just hadn't provided that previously when they saw that what they were proposing exceeded 40%, they wanted to make sure and establish the other the threshold that they were requesting. So it's simply because of the design that they're choosing? To Correct. So with that extra 15%, we still have <coughs> the proper amount of drainage or ability to control the stormwater on those that development? That'll have to be sized with stormwater management and I got a meeting Friday morning to go over that with them. So it doesn't compromise that we can make no they're gonna have to be the we still have to they still have to conform to what needs to be done. Right. Okay. Yep. Like I said we'll meet Friday morning with the developers and so okay. cut some details in there and that'll be part of the final plan review process and final planning process. Okay. One thing to keep in mind too is the uh, the outlots. I know we had talked about making sure the council is aware with this developer we were able to to get them to provide those as uh, you know set aside for us without any cost. Um, so that may not always be the case with all the developers in town. In fact, right now we're having a discussion on that. So you know we felt like as staff it was important to be consistent. So you know if you if it seems like we're kind of pulling the firm line, it's because obviously certain developers are willing to to do that, and it makes sense to. You know, water is a huge issue here, and we know that. And we're not going to just, you know, open the floodgates, I guess, uh, to to that. So, okay. Thank you. Um, that was my biggest concern. With, so, extra hard covers. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, comments? Brendan, in your discussion on these private streets, they're still needing to meet the city standards, but. I recall from the planning and zoning, these are still going to be narrow mm -hmm. streets, aren't they? Correct. Yep. So there's going to be no parking um, along the streets, and then the, the cul-de-sac diameter is what we prescribe within our subdivision ordinance for a certain diameter. Okay. Um, that, that is a concern from fire. Um, how do you enforce that? No parking in there, but that's with any private street that we have within our community. So uh, one of the discussion points that we need to have when we approve these. So is big enough for the fire trucks to get in and turn on if the no parking is enforced yes yeah. oh, right. yeah. okay. there we have or they have added and which was a recommendation of um, one of the conditions of the planning and zoning commission was to show no locations of no parking signs uh, where they would be located and the design and maintenance of those um, will be are recommended to be detailed within the um, construction plan Anything else? Thank you very much for the information. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, so we've got the first resolution approving a conditional use permit for a planned unit development for the property known as Big Little Boys Lease Edition. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Okay, so we have a second. I'll second it. Thanks, Lonnie.
County. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we have a resolution approving the preliminary plat for the property known as Bigelow Boyd 8th edition. I'll make the motion. I'll second that. Thanks, Dan. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And thanks Thank for coming you. tonight. Appreciate it. Old business. Doesn't necessarily pertain to our next guest, but old business. Mike Bubani. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything personal there, Mike. But you're under old business for some reason. You know. I'll tell you what. Thanks for coming. I've been down. thrown out of nicer places. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming down, Mike. Oh, no. Uh, first of all, let me thank you and especially staff. Uh, a month or so ago, uh, you were presented with an opportunity to uh, pursue a refunding for the um, tax increment bonds associated with Shopco slash Folkstead, and I was unable to attend. So uh, and those are the kind of meetings that I really, really like to make. So I appreciate uh, staff handling that on my behalf. But I'm here tonight. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with <coughs> where to start and how deep we want to go in the discussion. So I'm just going to start from the high 30,000 foot view and then we'll just work our way down to the detail level. And when you feel like you've learned or heard enough, you can just give me this sign and I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, but basically why we're here is to consider a proposal uh, to issue new bonds, to refund some old bonds, uh, to lower payments going into the future. Um, your savings would be achieved through two pieces. One is lower interest rate than what you're paying today, and also the fact that your debt service fund associated with the original project has a ton of money in it, you know, over $900,000, because uh, portions of the project uh, never happened. Okay, um, So between those two, uh, we're projecting significant savings. In fact, higher savings than what you saw a month ago. Um, so what happened since a month ago is uh, working through a brokerage firm soliciting proposals from a variety of banks. Um, they were due uh, Monday morning and the reason you will receive this material today as opposed to when packets first went out is because we didn't have any results yet. Okay? Uh, you also received the sales resolution which was drafted by your bond council, Briggs and, well, formerly Briggs and Morgan, now Taft Law. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to focus on, the, do you have this spreadsheet in your packet? There's two pages associated with it. Um, one of the things that's important to, to recognize about this particular refunding issue is that the underlying bonds that you're currently paying on are not technically callable. Meaning you made a promise back in the day that you would not prepay those bonds until February 1st of 2021. So, in order to get this done, since we're in advance of that, is we do an advance refunding. That's one where we borrow money today and we take that money and we, for the most part we put it on a shelf. It's invested and it's just there to pay the principal and interest payments on the prior bonds on your behalf between now and the call date and then the rest of the money will pay off the uh, remaining principal at that time. This all happens behind the scenes. Um, staff won't even have to worry about this. This gets handled by the escrow manager. The reason I mention that is because um, advanced refundings are inefficient by their nature because you're not just refunding the, the prior principal, you've got the interest due between now and the call date that you have to take into account. So whenever we look at a refunding, we have to take into account all of the issuance costs, and as you can see, it's got awful expensive, plus the fact that the money that you invest, that you put on the shelf, it's going to earn interest less than what the interest rate is on the prior bonds. That's called negative arbitrage. And so we have to take all those costs into account and make sure we're still saving money. Okay. So if we just skip for a moment and flip to page two, there's a comparison here of the old bonds compared to what the new bonds would be. and. Um, in gross savings over in the bottom right, you save $635,000. In, in present value terms, um, over 190 grand. Those savings would be real. Okay, that's after issuance costs, that's after the inefficiency that I discussed. Um, so those are real. So the question might be, well Mike, if we had waited and rates stayed the same, and we did it later when the old bonds were callable so we didn't have to have money on the shelf and we didn't have to have inefficiency, what would be the difference? 
The difference is you'd save more money. Um, the, the issue is, is I don't know where interest rates will be tomorrow, much less February 1st, 2021. I was here a year ago, Nancy? I, I don't remember what it was. And we looked at this before, and I had recommended at the time not to move forward with this, mostly because the longer you are from your call date, the more inefficiency there is. And also the fact that at the time, looking at the market at the time, with this 900 some thousand dollars of cash you had, I, th I thought, you know what, you could save close to the same amount just by waiting and just doing a partial prepayment on the old bonds and don't refund anything. But now we're in a different place. So when I look at this $193,000 in pre present value savings, um, about 100 grand of that is due to the cash. You could just you could save that just using cash, but we're getting another 90,000 because of the, the refinancing. So the gap has widened so much. That's why this year I felt like we can we could pass on this. We don't have to do it, but I wanted to make you aware that this opportunity is here, and we could lose out because if rates go the other direction, then you know, there's no savings. So yeah, it doesn't seem likely that over the next six months the rates will move dramatically. Um, I, your crystal ball is as good as mine. The, the reason I, I, I'm kind of hesitating is because just today, City of Warren is doing something similar, um, and their investments um, dropped their savings by $10,000 from two days ago. It, because you've seen the market, what's happened with the coronavirus fears and so forth. So while you could say, yeah, I don't really see much happening, you could, it, it, we can't move as quickly as the market. It's just impossible. Um, but that is the discussion, that is the question, is where do we, I always say, what's your risk tolerance? You know, um, if you're prepared to just wait, then, then that's what you would do, um, recognizing that you could do better or you could lose out. So your best to determine what your tolerance is. Um, I felt these were significant enough that we should come forward. When I showed this, to, when staff on my behalf showed this to council a month ago, we were projecting about 160,000, I think, in present value savings a month ago. So of the banks um, that returned the proposals, the lowest one was your local Bremer Bank um, with a 3.2% interest rate. The next rate was like 4%. So your local bank did solid by you. I would also tell you that the rate they offered is suitable and fair because that same example of Warren that I recently mentioned, they had a deal out to almost exactly the same uh, term, and they got higher rate uh, than what you did. And, and you should get a better rate than them because I believe you're a better credit. So it felt um, fair. Um, <clears throat> going back to the uh, first page, if you look in the upper right in red, it says subject to final investment pricing. Just a couple of days ago, I had prepared this report for Nancy. And one of the variables that we cannot solve tonight, the 3.2% from Bremer, that's good. You can take that, you're locked in. The part that we won't know, uh, probably for at least another week, is the investments in the escrow. Because we won't um, finalize those probably for another week. So that's why I say it's subject to investment uh, pricing. So if you look at this left-hand quadrant, upper left-hand quadrant of the page, uh, you can see the the amount of principal and interest that we need to put into the escrow and then it's offset by interest earnings. Well, just a couple of days ago, the net earnings from the escrow was projected to be two or three grand higher than this. So just in, in, just in a couple of days, we've seen the savings go down. Right? Now, what I told Nancy is, let's say it gets to the point where um, in investment earnings are not worth the additional fees of screwing around. Because there's, there's a variety of fees that are associated with the, the escrow fund. Uh, one has to do with the sufficiency opinion. There's a couple of thousand dollars in there. And then there's also, um, there's some bidding processes that go on in, in the escrow fund. There's fees associated with that, but that's actually taken out of the interest earnings, so you don't actually see it as an expense. But in a worst case scenario, if we get to the point we might decide that your escrow will just fund it fully with cash and not have any investments. Because if the fees equal or exceed what we can earn, there's no point paying the fees. But even if we get to that point, your, your savings would be 
um, significant and even still higher than what I showed you a month ago because of the great rate we got from Bremer. So, for instance, just a quick figure, it's not going to be perfect, but quick math would be um, your savings would go down by the investment earnings shown by that $13,000, but then offset by the reduced fees. So let's just say it could be, you know, ten to $15,000 less than what I'm showing you tonight. That's the worst case scenario. You're still way ahead of what I showed you a month ago. So, um, in my mind, significant savings to be had in, in any event. But I don't foresee that happening, but getting back to your comment of where rates are going to be, I, can, I don't know. Sure. And I'm not going to lie to you, so. Um, we, we plan to lock in the investments on March 6th, that's Friday next week. Okay, so by the end of business day, Friday, we'll know exactly what the final savings are. Um, but I don't anticipate it can move too much, like not much more than what that earnings is shown on the first page. Going down into the issuance costs themselves, um, you can thank staff for this. Um, you'll see the fiscal fee is offset by $1,500. That's because you had commissioned us a year or two ago um, to do some capital financial planning. As part of that process, we had promised to do uh, a credit on all bond issues, 1500 each time until you got your original fee for that capital financial plan back. And staff was the one that pointed that was missing a month ago. So I um, wasn't trying to sneak one by you, but the mayor's comment about me being old is probably well placed. Uh, we also uh, worked with Bond Council to get their fees reduced too. I think I had $10,000 on that a month ago as well. Um, and that's going from memory. Um, looking down at the cash flow, uh, one of the real nice things about this is currently the city is levying about $75,000 a year, Nancy, to help support these payments. If you look down at the cash flow down below, those will be dropped down to about fifteen grand a year. As a result of this, so in terms of your budget capacity, this should give you some nice uh, flexibility to use that for other projects or tax relief, whatever you decide. Okay, I'm going to stop there and see where questions take us. Any questions for Mike? You're the pro. What's that? You're the pro with this. The rate for a taxable bond is a pretty good rate, so 3.2 is all. Right, so uh, let me give you another community that had a similar length deal. I um, can't remember which town it was, but they were at 2.6%, but that was tax exempt. Right, right. Yeah. so the 3.2 for a taxable bond for the length of time we have. It used to be, so, so the difference there, it, you know, 60 basis points or so, it used to be that the difference between a taxable and a tax exempt was point and a half. And that shrunk when they redid the taxes. Um, so yeah, this is a, a nice result. Yeah. Any questions? I want to make a motion that we approve the refunding. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. I know we can't be the crystal ball about rates, but we just got right. guaranteed. Yep. Things, so but we will we will get you the updated so reports so. just as soon as we can. Okay. And uh, you know I haven't had a chance to meet Tim as well, but I believe Nancy and I and Tim will be meeting in the coming weeks to get up to speed. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Thank right. See you on your way home. On to the rest of the engineers' report. All right. Thank you. Make it quick and short. Uh, two quick ones. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, 16th Street Roundabout and the 16th Street Northwest Extension. Ultimately looking for a motion or some direction from the council tonight to direct staff to proceed with an agreement with MnDOT for 900000 in funding for that project. Um, in your council packet includes a letter requesting the LPP funding that was back in October. We made the request to MnDOT. Um, and then Dwayne and I met with MnDOT and uh, asked them for this funds. We asked for $1.3 million. Um, at the meeting, they beat us up a little bit on their cost participation schedule. Uh, long story short, they came back and said that they can fund up to $900,000. Um, so it leaves a $400,000 shortfall in what we asked for. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that's as much as we're going to get based on, again, MnDOT's cost participation schedule. Um, so the big picture is we were going to take the 1.3, supplement that with $2.7 million of our municipal state aid money. That is basically all of our money, I'll call it in the bank, we got a million, and then looking at borrowing ahead, 
uh, five up to five years to generate another 1.5 million ish um, dollars in there because that was the city council's most important project in the city for our municipal state eight dollars. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, I think if we move forward with the $900,000 agreement with MnDOT, we'll move forward with design and see how kind of these costs work out and see how that works in our municipal state aid. I'm just worried that we may not have this much money um, to get the full project done. Um, so if we end up in that situation, then maybe we just build the roundabout and we stub out 16th and then we let our funds uh, recover and get built up again and then run the extension. That's something that we'll, we got to look into a little bit more details as we move forward. Um, so again, that's what we'd be looking at. Um, in your council packet is what we're looking at, the scope of the project. Uh, that should look familiar. That was in the council packet in October when we approved this for funding. Um, that is a roundabout. Uh, in dark blue, there's Schedule 1 at 16th and 57 again. Schedule 2, which is that purple section through uh, uh, the Shooty property. And then Schedule 3 through the county property over to County 21. Uh, this does not include Schedule 4. Um, that's the North Service Street uh, that we'll be looking at as a future date, uh, kind of waiting that out until we know what the potential development to the north is. Um, so again, looking at direction to basically move forward with uh, with MnDOT to get a formal agreement together for the, that 900000 um, and then using our municipal state funds to ultimately build this. Um, schedule, MnDOT was looking at uh, us potentially doing it in 2022. I'm not sure if we can get all of our ducks in a row. we got to get right away. we got to get some power poles relocated, so that's something I want to leave open of the opportunity of building it in 2023, we won't lose the money, uh, but I need to work the more details out. Um, obviously, I don't want to let the money go, so we'll figure out a way to get it done and built in one of those years. Um, again, looking for some direction on moving forward at the city. Um, if we have this $400,000 shortfall that we we're planning on, is it still a, a project the city wants to move forward with to leverage and min dot money, supplement it with our municipal state, which is money that we're going to get anyway, use it on our system as it being desert most important project to use those funds for. Um, I think that's the big picture conversation line if you have a question. Yes. Okay. So if we go with part of this, you're talking the blue schedule. Yep. So how is that going to tie the driveways to foot and tune into that? Are they going to have to come back into Cunningham's to get on? So because it part of the deal was MnDOT didn't want access right into that roundabout, correct? Yeah, you're exactly right. In our figure here, um, we show two little X's there, and that's closed yep. access. So there's actually some city frontage or city right away as a frontage road along the Trunk Highway 57 um, right away in itself um, that we would use that to ultimately um, remove those X's that are close to the roundabout, move them to the north, and then provide another access and fit access out to 57. Uh, so we have some room in there. It's kind of being used now as the parking lot. We'll let it city right away. So we're going to have to work that through with those um, businesses on ultimately cutting those accesses off and moving them farther to the north outside of the roundabout area. And that would be included in the project. And that's okay with having that access to the Yeah, north? one thing we talked about when we met when Dwayne and I met with the traffic and there's something we got to work through. Uh, my opinion is they access a city street, which in turn accesses a trunk highway. We can move our city street farther to the north. Long term, I think we'd cut all those access off and they would use the North Service Street. I just don't think that that is um, enough of a need at this point to spend that as another you know, larger chunk of money there. Um, that is going to be tough for us to recover through like a development agreement process because they already have access. Um, but then I think that long term goal, if the area to the north <coughs> develops, which in turn would need that access service street, which we call North Service Street there, the back of the road, um, that would be the time that that would be built and then we'd reconfigure some access there. Okay. Um, all things we got to start working through here, and that's where I'm a little cautious on committing to 2022 that we got to get some things worked through with access um, right away. Tim and I met with Mr. Shooty tonight to start talking about some of these things to let him know that it's coming. Um, and I think maybe, and I'll call it worst case scenario, but I'm not sure that's the worst case, is we accept this 900000 we build just the roundabout, we start stubbing in the 16th Street, you know, road closed, and then we wait for the rest of it to work itself out west of the roundabout. We still would leverage that 900000 We'd still supplement that 900000 of their municipal state aid money to make us whole so we can build the roundabout. And if we ever delay 16th Street to the west to recover the funds that maybe were short, then we worry about that at that time. That's so we don't lose that 900000 We get the roundabout built in there. Um, still knowing that 16th Street's a pretty critical wig, but we're also looking at a $4 million project. That's an expensive section of road we're going to build here. So, but um, In my view, 
this roundabout is a safety issue. I mean, for Absolutely. the school and 16th, and if we have it blacktopped out to 15, traffic is going to increase on 16th. Absolutely. So uh, I think we need to push. So here was nodding, so I'll proceed uh, if that's the direction to yeah. develop the formal agreement with MnDOT and Tim and I will work on the 2022 or 2023 date. Uh, just not, don't quite have that hammered out yet, but we'll work on it. What, uh, I forget, when is Manorville being, is that 23 or 22? Uh, 23. So Manorville is going to be reconstructing from the bridge uh, through the north <coughs> and through the <coughs> county facilities through the <coughs> main town in 2023, similar to our project in 2021. So another reason to push it up to 2022, but again, we're going to work out some things before we can come shovel ready and sure. get a contract on board. So. Again, we'll work all those details if that's the direction we move forward, and I assume the direction is get it built as soon as possible. We can get it funded. So, yeah. general direction, I guess. But we're I don't think you need a motion right now. If the council's comfortable with that, we'll move forward yeah. and getting those agreements. Sounds good. All right. Uh, second item there: a building demo for 85 East Veterans Memorial. That's uh, just east of Maston Creek, north of Veterans Memorial or County Road 34, and then 105 15th Street Northeast which is the property on the south east part of the roundabout we just discussed. Um, we went out for quotes to ultimately demo those two structures that are currently owned by the city. Um, East West Memorial Parkway was secured by the city um, through tax forfeiture, I believe, in the 10215 Street we purchased, uh, knowing that we'd need that right away to facilitate uh, the proposed roundabout at 16th Street and 57. Uh, we went out to bid there. You can see uh, we do have a resolution for your consideration by passing this resolution to authorize us and staff to enter into a contract with uh, Fraser Construction amount of $64,649. Uh, they were the lowest bid. Uh, you can see we had three tight bids in there that were pretty close to um, each other. They were over the engineering estimate that we had in there, $45,000. Um, we didn't understand uh, when we gave the estimate the level of regulated waste that were in those facilities um, and the mitigation that was required through the, through the contract. Um, so when we got into it, we realized that um, ultimately the counter is not going to mitigate the asbestos. They're going to treat the whole facility as asbestos and line all their trucks and have a higher disposal cost due to the level and the, just the way that um, uh, the two properties ended up being. One, uh, the Veterans Memorial House had a lot of asbestos and the other one had a lot of mold in it. And they just said, we're just going to put it in a box and handle it that way. Um, so just over what we were estimating. Um, with that said, the parcel at 102.15th Street through the disaster declaration we understand is going to be funded through that. We submitted that for funding, um, so that is likely going to be funded at 75%. So if we break down the bids, the, the outlier there would be about 28000 and change that would be fundable through FEMA, and the 36300 is what the true kind of uh, capital outlier the city would have in demoing these two structures. So um, again, passing the resolution would authorize us to enter into contract with Fraser on behalf of the city and um, we do recommend uh, moving forward those bids so I can answer the questions you may have. What kind of timeline was, it, uh, was that in there? I don't. Um, it's something that we think that they're going to, I know we had an early completion date, I can't remember that date that we have to get everything wrapped up, but it was going to be wrapped up by, I think it's June might be the completion date. Something yeah. that we wanted to have them get in the winter time, you know, now obviously spring's coming. I would think they would want to get it done before yeah, they get start, it in the spring. start tiling what we're doing. Yep, get all those structures out of there and yeah. get them hauled off uh, during the winter hours. There's not a lot of work going on right now, so at winter time. So that's the schedule. I think it was like a June first completion date. So was the final. But, but I know you're sure we get it done. Make sure we get it done because you have that other project to finish. Yep. Flood mitigation. Yep. Mm -hmm. That that all go into grass. Correct. Yep. Um, the grant property, again, the east of Masson Creek, we're going to take down all those trees, uh, replant grass there. Um, same thing, there's not a lot of trees up at the other structure up on 15th Street, but I think there's one tree to come out there and we're going to plant it all down to grass in both, both locations. I just see uh, right now that it's vacant. You always have a semi parking in the driveway. I was just making yeah. sure. Yeah. We are uh, kind of have some parking instead. Make sure. <laughs> We make sure that doesn't happen once it becomes a grass. I mean, that's not your problem, but it's just something that the council needs to make sure we keep an eye on. Okay, anything else? Any other questions for Brandon? Okay, I'll 
entertain a motion to approve resolution awarding and approving the demolition of structures at 85 East Veterans Memorial Highway and 102 15th Street Northeast. I'll make that motion. Stand. We have a second. Second. Thanks, Mayor. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate it. On to personnel <coughs> the library need job description. Just uh, informational to let you know that that's been advertised, and I think they're due on the 6th. I think that's what it is. But we'll be doing a re preliminary review here at City Hall and then forward and acceptable applicants onto the library board for their selection. Perfect. Thanks Can for doing it. Jump in there. Sure. I, I don't know if you want to change the process, but in the past, Council has approved, I apologize for the miscommunication, Council has approved uh, new job descriptions, this is a new job description, as well as change job descriptions. So I, I would respectfully request that a motion to approve the new job description, if I could, unless you want to change the process and not go through this. No, that's fine. Yeah, because this was a, basically a new position that grade two, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll make the motion. Thanks, Val. Do I second? I'll second it. Thanks, Lonnie. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thanks for putting that together. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, administrator's report. Sure, you've got a number of items there. Um, and I've got a couple of informational items in there, too. Uh, one of them, we already talked about the parking rack, of course. This uh, street improvement bill uh, was, was heard last week. Um, so we'll see what kind of move, movement. I don't expect to see a lot on the legislature this year, but they're at least talking about it. Um, one of the other items that I have in there is this resolution supporting infrastructure accountability. And you do see a sample uh, resolution. Um, the league has asked us just to uh, to discuss or possibly approve one of these at a, and we can do that at a future meeting if the council feels it's appropriate. Um, basically, it's, you know, in part due to some of these items, litigation that you're familiar with, the Harstad Woodbury case. So they're looking for uh, greater powers, basically, from the state legislature. So uh, just wanted to bring that to your so, yeah, if you want to bring that back, that'd be awesome. Sure. And then I do have a couple other items. Um, I'm just going to pass them around here. And you've seen these before. Uh, last year you approved a, a plat for a Thompson edition. This is more of me just trying to get feedback from you, and I don't absolutely need anything. So the, the one I'm passing around right now is the one that was approved or something very close to it. And then, do you want to give me that one? Okay. Good. And this one is the one that was just submitted again. So basically, I'd like to see where the council's at in terms of uh, how they would like to, if they'd like to consider this as a, a phased item, or if they would like to uh, require uh, Mr. Thompson to go through the, uh, the process again. Uh, I know that the, the Planning Commission um, had that on their agenda and it kind of got pulled off the agenda, some objections to that, but I wanted to at least bring it to the councils just because uh, you can see there are some, some differences there. Um, So, wouldn't you have to come back to planning and zoning to meet well, the plan? Well, I mean, I, I think the argument could be the argument could be made that this is simply a first phase of the project that meets the the current approved plat. You know, if you wanted to make that argument, you could make that argument. I think that's the argument that the the Mr. Thompson's made. I, I don't think it's the same plan. I no, no, no agree, different no. buildings. Different buildings, sizes, different lot sizes. Different. I think right. you would have to bring it back and make sure, sure we follow every, yeah. so we can see everything in case there's something we're missing. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, staff kind of agreed with that too. It's just a matter of wanting to make sure we, you know, got the council, you know, informed about it. Mm -hmm. I know I, I talked to some of the planning commission members and, and we talked about it too, but I just wanted to run past you and make sure that you were, you know, on the same feeling before we move forward with, you know, returning it to the planning commission. You know, I, I know that you know there may be some people that don't like that, but I think that it's necessary to do it. I think we follow the proper channels, make sure we don't miss something. Sure, it's my opinion. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's what we move then. So I appreciate that. that. I just wanted to bring it to you though, because uh, you know, I think it's important that, like you said, everything's consistent. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. You bet. Uh, other than that, I think you've got my report there. Okay. Oops. And on the correspondence, any questions on the correspondence? It's all in there. Entertain a motion for adjournment. I'll go to second. I'll second that. Thank you, Stan. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks, everybody. Have a good couple of weeks.
caught it the whole time waiting. Yeah. Like,